So moving on, I, here in Cache County, one thing that I love to study is the history of places. And Cache County wasn't initially settled by a European settlement, the Mormon pioneers, because it was considered an icebox. And in some ways that is true. It is an icebox. Uh, the last few years haven't been as bad. But uh, during a drought in the 1850s, 1860s, uh, on the Wasatch Front, Brigham Young decided to send some folks up here into the Nibley area, and because Nibley has permanent water, the high water table, and grow grain, and the grain did fabulously. And it was found that things could be grown in the Cache Valley, and so down in the Nibley area, and in Wellsville and a few others, um, agriculture radiated out from there. Uh, Providence, my ancestors, my mom's a Zollinger, uh, Providence and the uh, Furmans over there started the fruit industry here and it was again assumed that maybe those things couldn't be grown. Lo and behold, we just needed to try. And so with the rich history of agriculture up here, I wanted to talk a little bit about how to grow a great garden. But instead of focusing a lot on the best cultivars or the best varieties, a lot of times it's our best practices that make that cultivar variety the best. And so if you can learn things like how to manage the soil, how to um, plant correctly, how to irrigate, how to fertilize, then all of a sudden what you might consider a mediocre plant or something that hasn't performed well will do very well. And so I think that's the more important part of gardening is actually learning the fundamentals and then you can start playing around with different varieties and things. Adri, would you give me uh, five minutes when I'm getting close to the end? Okay, thank you. So, preparation. I'm going to move around a little bit. I don't really like to stand. Um, when to plant, what to plant. And I have taken into account Cache Valley as compared to the Wasatch Front. So, most of your garden vegetables are going to require more than six hours of bright sunlight a day, preferably eight or ten. But if you can only get six, a lot of times that is fine for things like tomatoes. During the hottest part of the summer, they may actually benefit from just a little bit of shade, depending on how hot we get. So, if you don't have access to a lot of uh, room or something, if you've got a little flower bed on the south or west side of a home, Somewhere like that, you can actually, you'd be amazed at what you can grow. While I was up here, I helped manage a community garden in Hyde Park near the Catholic Church, and people would have a 10 by 20 plot, and you would be amazed at the amount of produce they would get out of those small spaces. Okay, soil. Now, I want to spend most of the time on soil. And to tell you, I, when I would get phone calls in the office here down in Provo, people would often say, I've got the worst soil on earth. Well, so does everybody. You know, uh, I, you know it's so clay, you know, and, or it's got this problem, it's got that problem, but you really don't know until, if you think it's that bad, I would recommend having it tested. USU has an analytical laboratory up on past 1400 North in the Skaggs Laboratory that you can bring soil samples in there and for around 20 or 25 bucks they will tell you everything you need to know about your soil and if it actually is going to need to be fixed. What nutrients you might need to amend with it and a lot of other things like that. So when in doubt, just have your soil tested. So now I'm, another thing I'm often asked, should I haul in topsoil? People have this imagination or this Thing with topsoil that they imagine that if I'm going to purchase a dump truck full of topsoil, it's going to be magical. Mickey Mouse has blessed it. Um, there's no weeds in it. It's this fluffy loam that little elves have sustainably fixed. And nah, it, it's just whatever crap came from somebody's latest <laughs> construction project, is all it is. Legally, by definition, topsoil is just the top anywhere from 18 inches or foot of soil. It's just soil. And so oftentimes what happens, unless you do your research, you'll call an excavation company. I'm not knocking any excavation company. And they'll say, I, I need 12 cubic yards of topsoil. So they go scrape off a construction projects, some new homes or something, 
load the truck up it may be screened before it goes out to get some of the larger weed material and rocks out of it and then they go dump it and you spread it and you assume that you got something better than you already had you haven't it's just different and so what I would say is be very very careful with topsoil get your soil tested first to make sure that you actually can't garden in it so things like if you've got so many rocks in the soil that if you tried to till it you would break your rototiller that might be an option to bring in some soil if you need to raise grade would be another one so if you need to raise up what you're doing but in general even if you have a clay soil your soil is going to be okay for gardening as long as you know how to manage it all right I'm gonna go forward just a minute here okay here we go and we'll get into the, some of that other stuff so benefits if you're going to spend money on improving your soil it's better spent on compost now when I talk about compost here I wanted to mention that you don't need really expensive compost about 10 or 15 years ago I remember it was actually a thing that you could buy little bags of elephant dung from Madagascar and you know there is some things where you know if you're supporting somebody that doesn't have a lot of money for a job that's different but that elephant dung is going to break down in the exact same thing as the dairy farm down the road in the end you know it's all carbon and it breaks down is broken down by the same bacteria and so when I look for compost I always look for a reliable source now the landfill up here has compost I actually Cache Valley I do compliment them have very very robust green waste system as compared to most counties in the state I, I do give them compliments you know there's many companies up here that will sell compost but some cautions and I don't care where you buy it from some cautions you need to look for one if it still smells like what it was made from so if it still smells like manure it's not finished two if you can see what it was made from it's not finished three you always want to, if you can, put your compost in. I'll just ask: Do you compost? Do you put major soil amendments in in the spring or fall? Fall. If you're going to be putting in three inches of compost in a new garden area, you're better off doing it in the fall. The reason being is that compost will break down over the winter, at least partially, and do what it's supposed to do. And here's the important part: if there's any salts in there the snow and the rain will wash them through so that you don't run into problems in the spring now again I'm not criticizing any compost manufacturer I'm not saying this one's better than the other but I don't care where it comes from if USU made the compost you still need to be cautious about the salts so if I'm incorporating compost in the spring in a normal garden not raised bed but a normal garden I'll do an inch at a time so I'll put an inch down spade it in I might wait for five weeks, six weeks, a month, whatever it is, spade in another inch. And I do composting during the spring and summer slowly so that I don't ever overwhelm my plants with too much salt. And as the soil microorganisms break that compost down, they actually rob the soil of nitrogen. And so if you get too much in there, you can stunt your plants because the microorganisms are more efficient at absorbing nitrogen than plants. And so that's why. I compost slower in the spring and summer and I'll put more down in the fall okay so compost what does it do it reduces soil compaction I'll show you some pictures of this in a moment and some other things that compost can do is that it as it breaks down it forms in essence a weak glue and this glue kind of binds the soil together so if you have a clay soil it, it creates some drainage but this glue also will weakly hold on to nitrogen phosphorus potassium and hold on to it so that it's available to the plants longer and so let's say you put your compost in with a little bit of fertilizer it actually makes it so that fertilizer stays longer in the soil before it leaches down into the ground but it doesn't hold it so tightly that the plants can't get to it and so compost whenever somebody says I need to improve my soil compost it doesn't matter what kind of soil it is compost will always improve the soil 
So I want to um, talk about a term called soil tilt. And that's kind of the feel of the soil. You know, I, whenever you rototill a soil, and we will get into that, you know, you fluff your soil up. But you know what kind of soil tilt you have after you irrigate. And if your soil turns back into cement, you don't have good tilt. So these are two pictures, and this was actually at the Hyde Park Community Garden. This is a brand new gardening plot on the, this side over here that had never been gardened in. This one over here, my master gardeners up here had put compost in for four or five years running. And you can see that just after one pass with a rototiller, how the structure of this, it's just a little bit lighter, fluffier, and it's not because of the tiller, it's because of the organic matter. And this is going to be a little bit more friendly initially to garden in than that one over there. And this, up in Hyde Park, this is a fairly clay soil. And so organic matter is fundamental to getting a good garden. Okay, let's see. So some sources of organic matter, you can always purchase compost, that's fine, but you also have access to grass clippings and weeds, which again, break down into the exact same things. The soil microorganisms are not that picky. So um, you can mow those up, there's a lot of ways to get them in, but the fall is a great time to do that. If you have flower beds or beds with perennial crops you can't till up, even if you put a layer of compost around those plants, soil microorganisms will slowly break them down at a rate of about an inch a year. So the soil microorganisms will incorporate them into the soil. And so we'll look at some rates here in just a second. Okay. So I'm asked oftentimes about sawdust. Does anybody know why you wouldn't put sawdust into your garden directly, at least great amounts? Go ahead. It's not acid. It's, you're on the right track. What will happen with a lot of things like wood shavings, pole shavings, sawdust, is that they are so, they have so much carbon in them that for those microorganisms in the soil to break them down, they rob the soil of every last bit of nitrogen. And so if you want to stunt your garden for at least a year, put in two or three inches of uncomposted wood shavings or sawdust, till those in, and then you will not really do well with your garden plants because the composting action breaks those things down so that they are ready to help the soil. These pole savings are in their raw form and it takes a year or so for the soil microorganisms to get them ready for actually for them to benefit. But in that process, it takes a lot of nitrogen because that nitrogen is not free in the soil, it then makes your garden plant stunted because there's not extra nitrogen there for them to absorb. So if you put pole shavings out, sawdust, whatever it is, no more than an inch and you do it in the fall. And oftentimes you add extra nitrogen fertilizer, so you would want about one pound of nitrogen fertilizer per 100 pounds of pole shavings or sawdust. Okay. Animal manures, a lot of animal manures break down into great compost. Now you're always using herbivore, so cows, rabbits, chickens, herbivores, um, and I'll explain some reasons later, but in the same sense, you don't want to go crazy with these and put three or four inches of raw horse or cow manure out in your garden in May and then try to garden in it in June. You're going to have too many salts and it's going to take a long time for that stuff to break down sufficiently so that you can actually use the soil. The next year, if you don't add any more, things will be fabulous. But for this year, you can stunt things and so you always want to make sure that that stuff is composted ahead of time. All right. Now, some one other things. I had somebody donate to me when I was at, still at the Hyde Park Garden helping manage 40 or 50 cubic yards of horse manure. And it had sat for a long time, and I just figured it's fall, let's spread it. And so we, I got some interns on a tractor, and you know we had fun plowing it in and playing around. And fortunately, the irrigation system was very deep, so we couldn't ruin it with a plow. But uh, the next year, and it broke down and did what it was supposed to do, the next year I had unimaginable weed problems. 
Stuff I'd never seen before in that Hyde Park garden. And so because that horse manure, even though I put it down in the fall, because it hadn't been composted, and when you compost things, you want them to heat up to 140, 150, 160 degrees, and you're turning that compost and continually adding water because the water evaporates out, because that weed seed wasn't broken down, it took me another two years to get rid of the weeds I brought in in the horse manure. And so you really do need to be careful with these things. Find your sources, make sure that things are composted well if you're using it, and beware of just putting in raw manures and things because you can run into problems. Question? Well, the question is, if you let the manure sit for over a year, will that help? The answer is if you turn it, you take your hose out there and water it down, keep it kind of the consistency of a wrung out sponge, absolutely. But if that just sits, no. It doesn't get hot enough because you're not turning it. And so there will be a little composting action, but then it slows down and stops. And so that manure pile needs to be treated as a compost pile and turned and kept moist. Okay, so how much organic matter should I add? So if you're happy with your soil and you've got a good situation, one inch a year will maintain what you have. If you're not happy with your situation or you have like gumbo clay or whatever it is, two to three inches of compost a year will make the situation better over a period of years. Now, one year of three inches of compost in a clay isn't going to help much, honestly. It will help, but if you do that for four years and five years and 10 years, you will get a situation where you'll create beautiful garden soil. My grandfather, who lived up in the Twin Falls area, had a really heavy clay soil, but every grass clipping, he had a smaller yard, but every grass clipping, everything from his garden, his yard, his kitchen, all went into his um, garden area. And by the time he sold his home because of age, he could take a shovel and stick it in his garden soil about 12 inches deep with very little pressure because he had improved the soil so much. Okay, so we've already talked about uh, the process of making sure that you have good product, produce, but I'm asked sometimes, what about cats, dogs, whatever it is, can we use their manure or even animal products like dairy, old dairy milk? powdered you know, milk, things like that. So the answer generally is, and this is from USU soil scientists, no, don't. The reason is, is yes, those manures will break down eventually into the same things as the cow manure, but for whatever reasons, things like dogs and cats, their manures are sometimes harbor diseases that are hard to compost out. They create really bad smells when they're mixed up with other things. And you actually may attract other animals into your yard thinking that there's some sort of competition trying to mark territory. And you could have more cats and dogs marking up your yard as their territory because of trying to. Now, there's some processes out there I've heard of, of composting cat manure and dog manure, but leaving it sealed in 55 gallon drums for two to three years at a time and things, very time consuming. And so for the general gardener, the recommendation is not to use your pets and other carnivore manures in your compost or burying them into your garden. Now, if a dog goes to the bathroom in your garden and you till that manure in, have you harmed anything? Probably not. It's when you really start to get that in concentration that you can do some harm. Okay, weed control. Uh, this is a picture of my neighbor. I live in Santa Quinn. And we have very rocky soil. And I convinced the neighbors, I did the same thing, but we convinced the neighbors that we shouldn't be hauling in topsoil. And so we would till three or four inches deep, get the rocks out, pull the soil off, till three or four inches deep, get the rocks out, pull the soil off. And he finally made his boy come out. And what this is right here, I took the picture through the fence, but the and it's still decent garden soil, but it was amazing the next year how many rocks surfaced. But I put this up here because of mechanical weed control. I am not, for as much as I know about chemicals and lawn weed killers and everything else, I'm not a fan of putting chemicals in my yard and garden. I'm just not. And so if I have weeding to do, I use alternative methods. I will not 
spray Roundup or a 2,4-D product in anywhere near my garden for a few reasons. One of them isn't just for health, but others I don't want the drift in things. And so as you go into this, the one number one thing I can say about weed control is to stay on top of it. Be out there at least weekly pulling all the weeds out. If you let your garden go for three weeks, four weeks, five weeks, you can quickly become overwhelmed if you're a new gardener and just throw up your hands and walk away. So some other things. Up here in Cache Valley, it's not too hot to use black plastic to uh, put your plants around. People will make the furrows and then get a four or five foot wide plastic, black plastic, and then garden through the plastic. That's great for weed control. There's um, mulches, you know, your grass clippings and inexpensive, you know, barks and things that you can get ground up. About three inches of mulch will keep most weeds out. Now, when I say that, it will not keep the morning glory or the field bindweed, same thing, out of your garden. But almost everything else is kept controlled with either a plastic mulch like the black plastic or three inches of grass clippings or another kind of mulch. Now, I'm differentiating between mulch and compost. Mulch is not broken down and it goes on top of the soil surface. Compost is generally partially broken down and mixed in. If I do need to use herbicides in my garden, I always do it before I garden or after I'm done gardening in the spring or fall. Uh, and I know that there's a lot of, especially if you jump online, there's a lot of controversy about glyphosate, the Roundup. And all I can really say is just because there's so many different schools of thought is that the EPA says that if you use glyphosate, follow the label for that seven to day waiting period before you plant and the EPA considers it safe. I am outsourcing that. I don't want to get into a lot of controversy about what it does and what it doesn't do. You can make your own decisions on it, but if you follow the EPA approved label, it's usually a seven to 10 day wait before you can plant again using a Roundup type product. All right, mulch is hand pulling. Okay. Gardening, uh, weeding actually burns a lot of calories if you get online. Um, it actually does, and it, it appears I don't do a lot of it, but um, it actually, gardening is actually a very good exercise too, especially pulling weeds. All right, so now let's get into some garden seeds. The, uh, there's a couple of different kinds of seeds available out there. Let's just check my time, and uh, we got about a half hour doing well. So open pollinated is what grandma and grandpa used for their garden seeds. Open pollinated seeds will come back true to type. Now, to do that, it can be easy or hard depending on the crop. Tomatoes, if you have an open pollinated tomato, the seeds about 96 to 98 percent of the time come back true to what the parent plant was. And so if you want to save seeds, um, beans, peas also come back true to type because they're self-pollinated, but it gets a little bit harder if you're looking at squash, looking at cucumbers. You can still do it, but you have to manipulate the flowers to where you know what a male flower looks like. Then you go play matchmaker and you can even make buzzing noise to pretend you're a bee. You've got your male flower and you're buzzing around and you wipe it around in the female flower. Make sure your kids aren't watching. We live in Utah. And... Uh, <laughs> then you need to actually, on a squash, take a clothespin or something and close that female flower off to keep other pollinators out of there. And from there, it gets more complicated with things like carrots and beets and corn. There's books out there on how to do it, but open pollinated refers to something that you can save on your own and, prop and bring it back the next year and it'll come back true to type if you know how to manipulate pollination. Let's see, so open pollinated seeds are usually less expensive because they're easier to produce, but some drawbacks, let's say, has anybody ever eaten celebrity tomato? A very common tomato. A celebrity tomato will double the yields in general of an open pollinated tomato. So, and celebrity is a hybrid. Nothing wrong with that, but one of the things about these open pollinated plants is that, again, they're what grandma and grandpa grew. 
and people sometimes like the flavors and the tastes and things of them, but they choose to do that knowing that it may not or probably won't be as productive as our hybrid plants. Now hybrid is not GMO. GMO is intentionally inserting genes that were not a part of that plant and making it do something that differently that's just not in its programming. So expressing a BT or becoming resistant to Roundup or something. So, and we don't have a lot of time to get into GMO, but I just wanted everyone to know that as I'm talking about hybrid plants, all we're really doing is taking two different tomato cultivars and crossing them, or taking two different kinds of apples and crossing them to get something different. So a hybrid, Sometimes, depending on how distant related, will not. Sometimes they're not. Uh, or take. Let me reverse that. Sometimes the seed doesn't come back true to type, or a lot of times it doesn't. But the hybrids can be a lot more productive due to hybrid vigor. So if you collect hybrid seed, and they'll usually have like an F1 on the package, or it says. Um, something like hybrid or whatever, but if you collect them, they're not viable or they come back to something different and you do get some increased disease and pest resistance often, especially in tomatoes, with them. Okay, so what to plant? 60 to 30 days. Oh, one other thing I should bring up on these hybrid or these open pollinated plants is that, has anybody ever seen in the local garden centers the sealed number 10 cans full of seeds that you drop in your freezer? Back when I first got up here, the economy crashed. And it was really big. People were getting back into saving seeds and getting their gardens going again. And I, these, a lot of companies started producing these where they were vacuum packing seeds. And a lot of times the seeds in these cans were very old, crummy cultivars and things that weren't that great. And I guess in an emergency, it's better than not having any. But my other thing with those was that if you are saving seeds, do you know how to start a tomato seed in your house? Do you have the facilities to do it? And so if you're buying seeds, preparing for the apocalypse, you've got to know how to grow them in your house to actually put them in your garden. Because peppers, tomatoes, a lot of our plants that we grow need to be started indoors or in a warmer situation and planted out later. So just be aware of that. Okay, so it actually is time that we can start gardening. I remember the first time I, you know, a part of extension, we're supposed to put out press releases and things, and on the Wasatch Front, mid-March is about, about as soon as you want to start planting things in your garden outside without frost protection. Here in Cache Valley, late March to April, early April, depending on the area. So I put together a press release saying that on the Wasatch Front that you could plant things like peas and radishes. And so I got a call from KSL, and they wanted me to come down, and I'm like, yeah, I get to be on the news. And so we did this whole piece, and it aired on the night of the biggest snowstorm of the year. <laughs> and underneath, the comments were playing, this guy's an idiot. Maybe we should trust other universities. And so um, in general, you've got to use common sense. And even though the calendar and the publication say, yep, March 15th, or yep, April 1st, if it's still snowy outside and cold, you're going to have to wait. So generally for a lot of these crops, the minimum soil temperature is around 50 degrees. You can purchase an inexpensive thermometer from Walmart or Kitchen Needs or wherever. That you, and Actually, a food thermometer works just fine as long as your bride or significant other doesn't know that you've been using their turkey thermometer in the garden. But... Um, you can stick that thermometer in the soil, and as long as it reads about 50 degrees, you're fine to start their, the cold season crops. So some things you can put out, onions, broccoli, radishes, peas, spinach, rhubarb, cabbage, asparagus, are all things that can start to be put, you can put in the next week or two. Uh, the onions, actually, if you try to plant onions in late May, early June, when our gardening season starts up here, you're going to have small onions. You need to get them in sooner because the onions require day lengths, and we'll talk about this more, but if you plant onions now, you're gonna get a lot bigger onions than you would planting them in June. So, okay. So 30 to 45 days before last frost. 
beets, lettuce, potatoes, and I should say that all this information is available online. If you Google USU and garden planting dates, um, Sean Olson, who's an extension person in Davis County, put together planting dates for all of Utah. So you can get this. Um, so you can see that these are staggered according to cold hardiness a little bit. After our last frost, beans, eggplants, sweet corn, cucumbers, melon, pepper, squash, and tomatoes. Okay, so how do I grow it? Utah State University, and I should point out our vegetable specialist, Dan Drost. Dan has been here since the mid-90s and has put a lot of time into putting together what I would call, if it weren't already patented, gardening for dummies fact sheets. And I mean that in the best possible way because when I plant a lot of my garden, for me, supposing to be the expert, I review the fact sheet. What's the spacing? What's the depth? What's the fertilizer schedule? Because it's a lot to remember. And so these fact sheets, there's no agenda, nobody's trying to sell you anything, and they're free. Now, the one other thing I will say is if you can't find it on the USU site, my plan B is always Google. And so I'll go into Google and just Google Utah State University and tomatoes in the garden, or Utah State University and corn in the garden. About every crop out there that you can imagine, Dan has done a fact sheet for, and in about two pages, he will tell you how to grow it and grow it well. So when people ask me, what should I do to grow this or that, I'm often actually referring to these fact sheets myself, and I send them, I'll email them the hyperlink so that they have a reference to go on. And they've been also, a lot of these have been slowly made more phone friendly, so you can actually be out in the garden with your smartphone, okay, let's plant corn. Uh, some other things at USU is getting more robust with on YouTube. You can actually learn vegetable planting, you learn fruit tree pruning, plant care. If you go to Utah State University Extension uh, and on YouTube and go to the channel, there's all sorts of things there that are just informative if you want to know more about gardening. There is even a video on how to get gnomes out of your garden. So, okay. So I've actually lifted this out of one of the fact sheets, the planting tomatoes. And you can see soils. Tomatoes prefer organic, rich, well-drained, sandy soils for best growth. Most soils in Utah will grow tomatoes, provided they have their well-drained. Clay soils will grow tomatoes just fine. Before planting, incorporate up to four inches of well compost or organic matter. Now, with that being said, a lot of those will say that, but I would do that a few weeks ahead at least. Again, we don't want to use that really hot compost, so do that ahead of time. And then he even tells you some fertilizers you can use per 100 square feet. And he'll tell you when to fertilize, how many leaves are on the plants, and all sorts of good things like that. Moving on, watering. Water the tomatoes deeply and infrequently, applying one to two inches of water a week. Use drip irrigation if possible. Mulch around plants will conserve. And so, I mean, this is as basic as these fact sheets are, but if you follow the guidelines, you will grow fantastic crops. Okay, let's look at, at some tomatoes. Heirlooms. Who here grows heirloom tomatoes? They're fun to grow. They're really fun. Why are, just asking the audience, why are, what are some reasons you grow heirlooms? Go. Flavor. A hybrid tomato, a lot of people say that the flavor's been diluted, and I've actually seen research that shows that the better a tomato stores and ships, flavor is, convert, is inversely proportional to how shippable a tomato is. And so when you say an heirloom probably has more flavor, it actually does. There's scientific research out there showing that it does. So, um, uh, go ahead. Yeah, and so a lot of these heirlooms have been around a long time, and they, are, they will grow healthy and do well. Now, will the yields be quite as much as our hybrid? No, but the reason we grow a lot of heirlooms is for flavor, for the color variety, orange tomatoes, purple tomatoes, red tomatoes, striped tomatoes, yellow tomatoes. So there's a lot of variety, and, you know, so, and they're really quite fun to grow. Now, if your soil is such that you've had disease problems with tomatoes, heirlooms may not be your first option. I would maybe grow hybrids because they have been developed 
to be disease resistant in a lot of situations. All right, oh, and some of these heirlooms have fun names. The Bloody Butcher is one, or Mortgage Lifter. During the Depression, a guy bred his own tomato, and he sold it and finally started selling the seeds, and he was able to pay off his mortgage, and so he named the variety Mortgage Lifter. Um, Mr. Stripey. So there's a lot of fun named heirlooms out there. All right, tomatoes. So some paste tomatoes. San Marzano, uh, I know Mark Anderson up here sells the San Marzano seed if you can't find plants, but you need to know when to plant those again. Amish paste, Roma, those are some good paste tomatoes. Cherry tomatoes, uh, Sweet Baby Girl. The only place I've ever actually seen Sweet Baby Girl tomatoes is here in Cache Valley, mainly because of Mark Anderson, but it's a fabulous cherry tomato. Uh, Super Sweet 100s on the Wasatch Front, Sun Sugar is another really good um, cherry tomato. Sweet 100 is another one that's been around for a while that people seem to like. Sandwich and beefsteak tomatoes, so these are slicers. The last five years, I have been researching hybrid sandwich tomatoes suitable for fresh market. So I mean, that's kind of the specific, a lot of people are like, oh, that's boring. So I've been spending a lot of my time every summer picking tomatoes, and growing tomatoes. And um, there's nothing wrong with a lot of these hybrid tomatoes. They're not so bred that they have lost all of their flavor. So Better Boy, Celebrity, I've actually, Celebrity, for the most part, is very high yielding, and it has an okay flavor. It cans well. It also is good for fresh sandwiches and things. So when I work with the fresh market growers, and the flavor comparison they usually give me they'll ask is, is the flavor as good as Celebrity? Because if it's worse than Celebrity, you probably have cardboard. And so, and that when I trial my tomatoes and look for flavor, that's what I look for. So of all of my tomatoes that I've been looking at as far as um, maybe stuff that maybe should be grown more, I've only got one year of data, but this bottom one called BHN 1021, in last year's trials, out yielded Celebrity, it didn't crack, it didn't, have any physiological problems, and the flavor was judged to be as good or better than Celebrity. The problem is, is where are you going to find it? I, it's a new enough tomato that you can order the seed online, and if you got it here quickly, you could start it. But, you know, people will talk about a lot of tomatoes that are so great, but unless you can find them at the garden center or have the ability to start them on your own, so a lot of times we're limited to things like Better Boy, Celebrity, Early Girl, and some of these really common varieties that we are very familiar with. Okay, sweet corn. This is another extremely common crop up here that did quite well. Soil temperatures need to be at least 60 degrees. And your row spacing, so your row spacing 24 to 30 inches apart. Now, I don't have time to hit every major crop. I'm just hitting some of them that were easier to grow, that were popular in Cache Valley. And they're popular on the Wasatch Front. So 9 to 12 inch spacing, plant 1 to 2 inch seeds, 1 to 2 inches deep, and fertilize them three times. Now, on your sweet corn, if you've ever grown sweet corn and your ears come out really anemic looking and they don't have a lot of really good kernels, it's usually a lack of nitrogen. Corn loves nitrogen. Now, I'm not necessarily saying that you need to dump chemical fertilizer into your garden if you're organic use organic fertilizer. That's great. The plants themselves have to have the nitrogen in one of two forms. And if you use an organic fertilizer, soil microorganisms actually break that down. You're adding some compost and things. But if you want to go organic and use organic fertilizers, do it. That's great. It's just that you still need to fertilize using organic fertilizers as compared to something like something you'd broadcast all over your lawn. So some other things with sweet corn, standard sweetness. This, the standard sweet, or SU corns, are what grandma and grandpa grew. You had to pick them on the day they were ripe and get them processed or eaten within 24 hours or they would taste like field corn. And so when grandpa picked that sweet corn and brought it in and it tasted wonderful, grandpa knew what he was doing because this stuff is a little hard to pick on the exact right time. Now, most of our corn, if you buy frozen corn or canned corn, 
in the stores, most of it's going to be like this because the kernels hold up better to processing than other corns, more modern corn varieties. So early V, Jubilee, Silver Queen, MK199 are standard sweets. Now, one thing that people will say about these is that even though they're not quite as sweet, they have the best flavor here. Now, we're getting into like wine tasting stuff, but I'm... You know, but there's been some say that these actually, if you're looking for true flavor, that these are the best. Okay, sugar enhanced, SE. Now, you may see when you go buy a package of corn, something like SU or SE on the package, this is what it means. Moderate amount of sugar. They refrigerate for a couple of days, so they're a little more forgiving. Uh, very popular varieties, incredible sugar buns, miracle, peaches, and cream. These ones right here, what you probably grew up with, are the sugar enhanced. They're a little more um, forgiving again. They're still fairly easy to grow. Now, more modern varieties like these SH2s, these are the most modern corn varieties. They, on one hand, grow well, but they're not quite as robust as the older corns, but they are very flavorful in that they're very sweet and they will hold for a week to 10 days in the refrigerator and keep their sweetness. And so there's some trade-offs with them, but in general, this is what most homeowners are shifting towards because the ears will last so long refrigerated. Now the complaints about these is that sometimes people think they're so sweet that they're just eating pretty much sugar. And so um, there's other kinds of corn, the newest ones are called synergistic, that have a combination of super sweet and the um, sugar enhanced to kind of mellow that sugar out a little bit and bring some flavor back in. So the synergistics are becoming a little more popular. Okay, we're getting down on the home stretch here. Let's see, time-wise about, about five more minutes and we'll call it five, 10 minutes. Okay, sweet peppers need to be planted from transplants and they don't require a lot of fertilizer. Let's get in some varieties. And this you can get online again. Uh, Bellboy, Hybrid, Chocolate Bell, Giant Marconi, Sweet Banana, Costa Rican. A lot of bells and sweet peppers out there. Now, one thing I will say about Cache Valley is that there's a lot of foodies up here, which is great. And a lot of them like to get away from just their standard pepper varieties. And so a lot of the local garden centers will either carry seed or varieties that you sometimes might not find elsewhere um, that are really good for cooking and things. And so uh, that's really wonderful about Cache Valley. But of these, Bellboy Hybrid has performed well for me. The chocolate bells I've grown. One other thing I will say about the peppers is that a lot of the varieties will tur turn to an orange or a yellow or a red. You can pick them at the green stage and they're fine, but if they get some color in them, they usually are sweeter. That's why the colored the red peppers, the red bells, and the yellow bells in the stores are generally double the cost of the green ones. Hot peppers. Uh, I used to work at Sam's Club back in the day, and I decided to cut up a bunch of Thai hot peppers and put them in the jalapeno juice, the pickled jalapenos. And you should have seen the people dancing and hopping and cursing. I, the manager told me never to do it again, but um, there's a lot of hot peppers out there. and. Um, one thing I will say, if you're trying to grow things like Carolina Reaper, the habaneros, the growing season up here isn't quite long enough, and so you may need to get your peppers in big pots and be able to bring them in at night or put them in areas where they're going to get increased heat. I used to do service out to the jail and teach horticulture to the inmates, and one of their favorite things to do is to have contests to see how many habaneros they could eat. And it was like this mochismo thing. And, uh, but we had to grow those for a lot of the season. We started them and we harvested them inside the jail greenhouse because the growing season wasn't long enough. Now I did, I was able to ripen Thai hots, jalapenos did okay, but the, a lot of these newer long season, um, super hot ones, the world's hottest peppers, the habaneros and the Carolina reapers may or may not ripen here. Okay, watermelons. You can grow watermelons and other melons in Cache Valley. The trick is, is to use floating row cover or short season melons or tinting them with low tunnels a little bit to get them going. So I, the instructions here, um, they do require quite a bit of fertilizer. 
46 cups per 100 feet. But you can grow them just fine. But if you cover your ground in black plastic over the furrows and grow short season watermelons, you are able to ripen watermelons every year. The same with the other musk melons like the cantaloupes. You shorter season, use the black plastic, and they'll ripen. Okay, honeydews, crenshaws, both will do well too. So potatoes, this is a very common crop up here. One thing I'll say about potatoes, you grow potatoes for the joy of it. Ch potatoes are so cheap in the store right now that you've got to want to grow them or you're growing varieties you can't find elsewhere. So if you just want the russets, get them from Walmart, you know. But if you're wanting blue potatoes or good red potatoes or good yellow potatoes, then by all means grow them because they're easy to grow. It's just that if you're just wanting the standard Idaho russet, I wouldn't waste my time, personally. But if you want to, because you want to know where they came from and what's applied, there's other reasons. But that's just kind of my opinion on them. So they're actually, I grew potatoes when I lived in Hiram up here every year, and they did well. So let's see. Of the russets, this russet Norcota, which is available in the stores if you want to buy, purchase, want to grow them, the russet Norcota is more tolerant of our heat here, even in Cache Valley. So you're more likely to get a better potato. The Burbank russet is the Idaho potato, and it, it, it's not quite as heat tolerant. But there's a number of them that will do well. I grew blue potatoes one year. Uh, Clark Israel said, my colleague, I had about 10 or 15 pounds of them. Nobody would eat them. And so Clark ended up eating a lot of them, but he fed a lot of them to his cows just because I was kind of disappointed, but you can do it. so. All right, onions we've already talked a little bit about. They do quite well up here. The, the Utah onion, the Utah sweet, the sweet Spanish, the Ebenezer, or even the Walla Walla will do fine here too. So uh, let's see, beans. Beans, if you have little kids, are among the easiest things to grow, two to three inches deep. You actually don't need to thin them very much. The one thing I will say is that the pole beans do require support, but you generally get 30% more crop out of a pole bean as compared to a bush. And so if you have limited space, do the bush beans, but if you want to get the maximum amount of produce per plant, do the pole beans and just support them. Okay, Swiss chard is another one, just getting a little bit more creative. Bright lights, this, that's this variety right here. Actually, down in Utah County, our groundskeeper uses this bright lights chard as an edging plant. I noticed that it disappears. I think he eats it too. <laughs> so, that chard's very easy to grow. Um, lettuce starts, um, you in a few weeks still, we're still a little early for it. So, okay, I'll stay around for questions, but I'm pretty much done. I appreciate your time.